The Schrödinger equation is often considered the most important equation in quantum mechanics. It's basically the one that governs how quantum states change and evolve over time, and I've made a handful of videos about it at this point. But I've not yet discussed the equation which I believe is the second most important equation in quantum mechanics, so that's what we'll talk about here. If you enjoyed this video then please hit the thumbs up button and subscribe for more fun physics content. Let's get into it. So the equation that we're discussing is known as the eigenvalue equation. A very generic version of it looks like this. In this video we'll understand what each component means in two different ways. One by considering what this equation means mathematically, and another by considering what it means in the theory of quantum mechanics. It's easier to start with the mathematical meaning of this equation as it's a bit more easy to visualize, so let's do that first. We can think of x as a vector. A vector is just any quantity that has some size and some direction, so we often represent vectors with arrows. Another way to represent a vector is like this, showing the horizontal and vertical component of the vector. These two pieces of information automatically encode both the size and the direction of the vector. Now, A can be thought of as a matrix that can be applied to the vector to transform it in some way, or in other words, give us another vector pointing in some other direction. If you're unfamiliar with matrices, they're essentially just a set of entries with a fixed number of rows and columns. For now, to keep things simple, we'll just consider two by two matrices. These can be thought of as transforming our original vector in some way. If you know about matrix multiplication, then have a go at this one. We can see that the vector we started with gets transformed into this new vector. But the thing is, for some matrices, we can sometimes find vectors that don't get transformed into another one, apart from maybe being stretched or shrunk. For example, here's such a vector for our original matrix. When we apply our matrix to it, the end result is a vector pointing in the same direction just stretched by this vector. When this happens, we say that we found an eigenvector for this particular matrix, and the stretch vector is known as the eigenvalue. This is why our equation is known as the eigenvalue equation. For a given matrix, in some cases, we can find a specific vector that does not get transformed to another vector pointing in another direction. In that case, our eigenvalue equation applies, and we found an eigenvector and an eigenvalue for a particular matrix. All other vectors that are not eigenvectors will still get transformed by a matrix, however. So those are the mathematical basics of the eigenvalue equation. How does this apply to the theory of quantum mechanics? Well, if we're studying a quantum system, there's a really clever way to represent the state of this quantum system as a vector. For example, let's say we're studying the spin of an electron. Certain particles like electrons behave as if they are spinning, even though they're not actually spinning or moving along a curved path. In other words, they have some inbuilt angular momentum that we can measure. And we call this inbuilt angular momentum spin. More on this in my video on spin, check it out up here if you haven't seen it already. For an electron, the amount of spin it has is fixed. But if we measure how the electron is spinning in this direction, then we could find one of two results. Either it behaves like it's spinning clockwise, or it behaves as if it's spinning anticlockwise. These are the two allowed states we could find our electron in when we make a measurement to find its spin. And these two spins can be represented as vectors in some abstract mathematical space. This is a really strange idea, but basically any quantum state that we can find our particle in behaves like a vector and interacts with other possible states just like vectors interact with each other. I've discussed this idea in much more detail in this video up here. Here's why all of this is important though. If a quantum state can be described just like a vector can, mathematically speaking, then making a measurement of a system can be treated mathematically as a matrix. In fact, in quantum mechanics, these matrices are known as measurement operators. A more correct way to say this is that the act of taking a measurement, such as trying to find the spin of our electron, can be mathematically treated like a matrix. Now, some states are eigenstates of our measurement operator. For example, let's say before we make our spin measurement, the electron happens to be in the spinning clockwise state. If we then make a spin measurement on this electron, the state of the electron stays the same making a measurement does not affect our system. And what we end up actually measuring when we make the measurement 
is the eigenvalue. In this case, our measurement result would be an angular momentum of h bar over 2, where h bar is just a constant known as the reduced Planck constant. In other words, this is the numerical value we find. It's also worth noting that eigenstates of any operator always behave like perpendicular vectors. There is no component of one vector in the other. In other words, there is no way to write one vector in terms of another. Whereas with a vector like this, we can write it as some combination of this vector plus some combination of this vector. So in many ways, making a measurement on a system that is already in an eigenstate is pretty intuitive. The system remains in the same state, and the numerical result we get because we made a measurement is the eigenvalue of the state. Just for the sake of clarity, this operator that represents a spin measurement in this direction for an electron actually has two eigenstates. The other eigenstate is the anti-clockwise spin. In other words, if our electron was in this state and we measured it, the measurement would not change the state and the result would be minus h bar over 2. The electron behaves in this state as if it's spinning in the opposite direction. But once again, I'll clarify here that the electron is actually not spinning. It just has angular momentum that corresponds to what it would have if it were actually spinning. This angular momentum actually has real world consequences too. I'll leave some resources down below if you want to find out more about it. But what happens if our system is not initially in an eigenstate? What happens if we apply our measurement operator to some other state vector? Well, let's once again recap our mathematical perspective from earlier. We saw that when our matrix was applied to a vector that was not an eigenvector, that vector ended up getting transformed. And similarly, in quantum mechanics, we can think about a state that is not an eigenstate or eigenvector of our measurement operator. One way to do this is to remember that in quantum physics, a system can be in a superposition of multiple possible states. For example, our electron can be in a quantum blend of having clockwise spin and anti-clockwise spin at the same time. This in itself is a strange idea if you've never heard of it before. So again, I'll leave some resources down below if you want to find out more. Now, this superposition of states can be represented by adding different amounts of the two spin vectors together. Just as we described, this quantum state is created by combining some amounts of the spin clockwise state and some amounts of the spin anti-clockwise state. In reality, what this means is that the electron has some probability of being found in either state when we make our spin measurement. And this is exactly what happens when we make our measurement on a non-eigenstate. By some random process that we don't yet fully understand, a measurement causes the state to change into one of the eigenstates. And we can even calculate the probability with which our measurement will result in one state versus the other. The probability of getting a particular result is just the square of this quantity. So for a state like this, we have a high chance of finding it spinning clockwise, but some small chance of finding it spinning anti-clockwise. Whereas for a state like this, we have a 50-50 chance of finding it in either spin state. Now, it's worth me mentioning here that this random collapse into one eigenstate is often quoted as a reason that consciousness controls the quantum world. It is supposedly the result of us making a measurement that causes things to change. But it's worth remembering that it doesn't necessarily have to be a conscious being doing what we're calling a measurement. This bit of quantum mechanics is not well understood yet, but the measurement could also potentially refer to objects in the universe interacting with each other. The other thing worth mentioning is a slight difference between what happens when you apply a transformation matrix to a normal vector, like we looked at earlier mathematically speaking, and what happens when you apply a measurement operator to a quantum state that isn't an eigenstate. Whereas in the earlier mathematical scenario, every matrix can be applied to any vector and you can calculate exactly what the resultant vector should be. In the quantum case, because we're talking about a superposition of states, this results in a random collapse into one of the possible eigenstates. So those are the small differences worth mentioning. I'd also like to bring up here that the Schrodinger equation, the one that I said was the most important in quantum mechanics, can also be written as a type of eigenvalue equation. When our system is not changing over time, we can write the time-independent Schrodinger equation, which looks like this. This operator measures the total energy of the system, and this is the numerical energy value that we measure. Psi are the various eigenstates that we can measure. So basically, there seems to be some rather wonderful link 
between how we mathematically deal with vectors and how we can represent quantum states using maths. And the eigenvalue equation has some direct correspondences to things we do and see in real life. Anytime we make a measurement on a system that is in an eigenstate of the measurement we want to make, the eigenvalue equation becomes important. And even if our system is not in an eigenstate, the fact is that we can write any possible state that the system could be in as a combination of the eigenstates of any measurement we can think of. As a result, the eigenvalue equation is still important because it helps us figure out the possible measurement results we could find when we make the measurement on our system. For this reason, I think it's the second most important equation in quantum mechanics. And with that being said, I'm going to finish up here. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, then please hit the thumbs up button and subscribe for more fun physics content. Please check out my merch linked below as well. It's a quantum dice design based on a famous quote from Albert Einstein. And finally, I'd like to say a big thank you to all of my Giga patrons and all of the rest of my patrons as well over on Patreon. Link to that in the description below if you'd like to support me on there. Thank you so much for watching and thank you for all your support. I will see you very soon.